So how do we begin to create value? The late chap of the United States Senate, Peter Marshall, he used to tell a story about the keeper of the spring. A story about an old man who lived in a forest in the Eastern Alps overlooking an Austrian village. Years earlier, a wise town council had hired this old man to make sure that the mountain waters flowed freely and surely into the village spring. And so year after year, this old man faithfully, he would go out in the woods, he'd pull out the twigs and the leaves and the branches and anything else that could clog or contaminate those mountain waters. Well, as a result, the mountain waters did flow freely and surely into the village spring. The spring blossomed, sort of the village itself. Vacationers flocked to the lovely town. Swans made their home by the lovely spring, and everything was peaceful, happy, and blessed. Years went by. And then another town council began talking about this almost mythical keeper of the spring. Does anybody ever see this old man anymore? Why are we paying this guy so much money? Well, you can imagine what they decided to do. The town council fired him, and they thought they'd made a great fiscal decision. But then autumn came, and the trees began to loose their grip on their leaves. Pretty soon, somebody noticed something very different about their lovely spring. It was changing color. And then a sickening smell began to hover around it. Well, the vacationers left. Swans began to look for a new home. Well, beginning to realize the error of their ways, the town council called an immediate emergency meeting, and they rehired the old man of the forest again. And he went back out in the woods. And he pulled out those twigs and those leaves and those branches. And pretty soon that mountain water, that life-giving force, was flowing freely and surely back into the spring, giving it fresh life, a new start. And everything was peaceful, happy, and blessed. You see, we are the village spring. Us individually, our companies, our organizations are the village spring. And if we don't take care of our customers, the mountain waters, it puts a stranglehold on the organization. It begins to sicken, it begins to smell. And if something's not done, it eventually dies. It's all about service. Mr. Ziegler used to say, you can have everything in life you want, as long as you help enough other people get what they want. And so how do we serve more? Well, I have a two-pronged definition of customer service. And the super successful focus on serving people. First thing is this, find a need and fill it. Find a need and fill it. Despite what we might want to think, your customers don't call you on the phone, walk in the door because they want to see your shining voices and see or hear your shining face, see your shining faces and hear your shining voices. Those things help them come back. Their family coming back. But they come to you, why? Because they have a challenge. So it goes right into that being a solution problem solver as well. They see us as the possible solution to whatever challenge they have. So we have to find their needs and fill it. And the second part of my definition is to do for the customer what we know they want done for them. How do we know what our customers want done? How do we know that? I got an amazing thing. Ask them. Ask them, what do they want? What does their family want? What does the next generation want? We always have to keep thinking, what's next? Betsy Sanders was from the, she's a VPO at the Nordstrom organization. And she wrote a book called Fabled Service. And if you've ever experienced a Nordstrom, you understand they, that's not just a slogan for them. They truly follow that fabled service philosophy. And she tells a story about a department store right around Christmas time. And if you've ever been to Nordstrom at Christmas time, you'll see the sights and the sounds, and many of them will have a piano player in there playing Christmas carols and so forth. It's a wonderful experience. Now, as this one lady was in there doing her Christmas shopping, she noticed something. A homeless lady walked into the store. And she's thinking, oh, she's probably trying to just get out of the cold and... Oh, they're going to kick her out of here. Oh, maybe I can help her out. Maybe, I, maybe when security comes, I can kind of soften the blow a little bit. And so she began to follow this lady throughout Nordstrom's. Now, the lady walked right up to the dress department, walked right up to the young clerk in there and said, I'd, I'd like to try on some evening dresses. The young clerk didn't 
throw her out of there. I said, well, sure, sure. And they found what size she was. And she went and got a lot of dresses. And she tried those dresses on. And, and the lady who was watching all this knew the lady couldn't, she couldn't buy any of those dresses. But she tried on a number of the dresses. And then she thanked the young clerk. And then she walked out of the store. Well, the lady witnessing this was totally dumbfounded at what she had just experienced. No security tossed the lady out of there. The clerk served her almost as if she was a real customer. And so she had to find out what in the world's going on. I think Nordstrom's have lost it. So she walked up to the young clerk and said, you know, I got I, I to gotta know. I just watched what happened. That lady couldn't have bought any of the dresses you just showed her. Why did, why did you spend so much time with her? And the young clerk didn't miss a beat. She said, because it's my job. My job is to serve and to be kind. Notice she didn't say her job was to sell dresses. My job is to serve and to be kind. Now, does Nordstrom's sell a lot of dresses? Yep, they do. They sell a lot of dresses. I wonder if there's a connection to serve and to be kind. I shared that story at a conference just very similar to this one. And after, after my presentation, a lady walked up to me and she said, can, can I talk to you for a moment? I go, sure. And she said, let me tell you what Nordstrom did for me and my friend. She said, my friend has a foot challenge to where her feet are two different sizes. And so as you can imagine, she doesn't have very many nice shoes because she has to buy two pairs of shoes every time she wants a nice pair to fit. Well, we were in Nordstrom's and, and she found a beautiful pair of shoes that she, that she loved, but she just couldn't think about buying two pair because they were pretty expensive. But when the shoe clerk came up from Nordstrom and he finally understood what was going on, he's going, oh, wait a minute. You don't have to buy two pairs of shoes. What we're going to do, we're going we're to measure both your feet. And we're going to make sure you get a, a, a shoe that fits on each foot. And you only have to buy one pair. As you can imagine, the lady was overjoyed. But then they wondered, you know, what do they do with all those extra shoes? So they asked him, what does Nordstrom do with all these extra shoes? And the guy goes, oh, it's not a waste. It's not a waste at all. We first of all want to serve you. Second of all, we take those extra pairs of shoes and we give them to people who have prosthesis. To serve and to be kind. You wonder why Nordstrom's number one in terms of customer service? Right there is why they're number one. Super successful people put others first and figure out how they can serve them.